Hey everyone, it's Instructor Jay with Guardian Training Consulting and wanted to take this opportunity to announce our fireside chat at five o'clock. We do this every weekday at five o'clock. Uh, we talk about a new, um, new subject every weekday and I'm in my backyard, it's absolutely gorgeous here where I'm at right now and wanted to take this opportunity to talk about AR-15s. Uh, it is a hotly contested uh, subject and I wanted to be able to educate everyone that's watching this on AR-15 AR buy-in guide. That's the best way of explaining it is. I'm gonna to bring uh, together all my knowledge and experience with the AR-15, um, bust some myths with the AR-15, um, and talk about kind of some you know, miscommunication about it and uh, some rhetoric that's been put up on it. Um, and we're gonna just dispel some myths and then go kind of go through some components their quality and, and that will set you up because these things are selling like hotcakes right now. Not a lot of people understand what they are and the capabilities of them as well as some limitations. Um, so the first myth that we're going to bust is uh, this is the AR and AR-15 does not stand for assault rifle. Um, it stands for armor light rifle. So the AR-15 was originally designed uh, by Eugene Stoner. Stoner uh, and he originally worked for the company called Armalite. Uh, when, uh, when he developed the rifle, um, he worked for Armalite, and then the 15th, the number 15 was actually the 15th patent, the 15th model of the rifle that he's designed. Um, and there's been a multitude of different designs that he's had. The two most successful ones is the AR-180, or the AR-18, and the AR-15. No Joe Biden, there is not an AR-14. Uh, just you're you're completely wrong about that. So uh, this is the most popular rifle, the AR-15, uh, which then became uh, the military designation M16, which was a select fire uh, rifle designed during Vietnam. Uh, so it went from uh, safe semi-automatic to full automatic, and then it developed into the M4 carbine, the the carbine that I carried while I was in the military, and that is also a select fire weapon. So it did that, in its two iterations, has safe. Uh, semi-automatic and three round burst or safe semi-automatic and full auto for the M4A1. That is a military rifle. This is not a military rifle. This is a, if you want to call a sporting rifle or just whatever you want to call it, it's a, it's a rifle. Um, a lot of times they're called uh, carbines. So uh, the reason why the carbine is the, the designation is because it's a short rifle and it shoots a small intermediate style cartridge. So um, that's the that's the meaning behind it. The AR does not stand for assault rifle; it stands for Armalite rifle. So uh, a lot of a lot of people think that these things just blow big holes in things and shoots and shoots you know just these dangerous dangerous rounds. So um, the first and foremost thing is the the uh, AR-15 is chambered in either 223 Remington or 5.56. So people think that the 5.56 and the 223 are interchangeable. They're really not. They're they're two different rounds. Um, on a layman's terms, they are very similar, but they're also different at the same time. Um, so your civilian, um, originally the designation of the of the AR-15 was in 223 Remington. So this is your your 223 Remington, uh, right here. Now you're going to see this is your 5.56. Um, so we got a first question: What would be the best caliber to use for an AR for hunting mid-size to large game? So, um, great question, Cade, and that's on my Instagram, my Instructor J Instagram. Uh, so there's a lot of states that require a minimum caliber. So that would be, uh, usually it's a 243. Uh, so your 223 uh, would not, or 5.56 would not meet most state minimums on hunting mid, mid to large game. Um, what, what would probably be sufficed onto that would be a 300 blackout uh, for short stuff or you know going up to you know a 6.8 spc or a um you know 458 if you really want to hunt something bigger i hope that answers your question kate um so uh those are different uh, uh variations of the ar-15 in, in different chamberings um so you have your 223 and then you have your 5.56 um again on for face value they look almost identical if not the same but they are two different rounds so the big difference is, um, the best way of explaining it is, is if you have a 223 rifle, you should only be shooting 223 out of it. 
So if it says on your rifle 223, you should only be shooting 223. Um, and I'm not going to get into the absolute nuances behind behind everything, but the big part of it is is chamber pressures. Your chamber pressure um, of a of a 556 versus a 223. Um, are significantly higher on a 5.56. So your rifle, if it's designed for 223, is designed for pressures at 223 levels. But if you have a 5.56 rifle, like my rifle here is a 5.56 rifle, um, I can shoot 223 or 5.56 out of it um, safely. Now, there is a degradation in accuracy because the length of the, of the chamber is different from a 5.56 to a 223. So if I shoot 223 out of my 556, there will be some portions of the barrel in the beginning that it will not engage with rifling. And that's the spinning the spin inside the um, the spiral inside the barrel, which then create in part spin upon the round. So I will not maximize ra uh, accuracy, but it's safe to do so. Now there are some chambers that are called the wild, uh, W-Y-L-D-E, um, as well as uh, the combo, um, so the 223, 556. It's safe to do that, and it's the the uh, the best way of explaining it is a exercise and compromise for that. So if it's in chambered in two two three, only shoot two two three. If it's chambered in five five six, you can shoot both, but there will be a degradation of accuracy at longer ranges if you're shooting two two three in your five five six uh, rifle. So um, just make sure you know what you're buying. On the ammunition component. Uh, we're going to discuss the different types of ammunition. So if you see here, yes, uh, they have different colors of casings, uh, brass versus nickel. Some have it heat treated. So you can see like your standard M855. Um, some of them have heat treating. You can see a very small band of heat treating. While this one is like M193, it's a full metal jacket. You can see a large amount of heat treating band on that. Um, both of them, these are brass, um, brass case. This one is a nickel case. So I'll explain the projectile differences. So the, uh, from going kind of hottest to, you know, the most tame is your MA55, which is a military designation of a um, full metal jacket with a bimetal interior. So the interior of this actually has a steel core in it. Um, so most uh, ammunition that you'll see um, have a, just a complete lead core. So it's a complete lead core with a copper jacket. That's the part that you see outside. It's a very thin piece of metal that coats around the copper, which prevents deformation because uh, lead is uh, can de be deformed very, very easily while copper cannot. So uh, your, MA55, a, your MA55, some people say it does have a uh, armor piercing component to it somewhat, um, but it is not an armor piercing round. Um, it is illegal to possess, own, and transfer armor piercing and ammunition that can be accepted, readily acceptable into uh, pistols and AR-15s can be accepted into pistols. Uh, that was a federal law that was passed under uh, Bill Clinton for law enforcement, safety of law enforcement. So your MA55, uh, just your MA55 standard is again a, a full metal jacket round with a bi-metal interior, uh, a uh, um, a steel interior. Good seeing you, Dan. Good seeing you, Logan and Marv, for joining me as well. Okay, so then moving down from that is your just your standard ball round or your M8 your this is a M1 M193 round. Uh, so this is a 55 grain round, the weight of the bullet itself and this is a 62 grain round. So this is a heavier than this one. M M193 is just a standard full metal jacket, so it is a um, a solid lead core with a copper jacket on it. Both of these when hitting stuff do not deform like the soft point. Um, if it hits body parts or uh, you know soft body tissue, it will zip right through. This is what the U.S. military. This is what we have to carry per the Geneva Convention after World War One. Again, it does not deform when it hits soft body tissue. While your soft point that has, you can see the exposed lead, the lead uh, core here. Let's see if I can get it on this one. There we go. It's exposed lead core. Um, so this is a full lead core with a uh, exposed and uh, copper jacketed with an exposed lead uh, base. So when it hits things such as bone or uh, tissue as well as hard objects, it will start to deform. Um, it, this is a bonded bullet. The, the definition of a bonded bullet is it's actually chemically and, and uh, thermally uh, bonded the, the jacket to the lead uh, projectile, which retains, which helps the jacket retain on the lead uh, so that when it hits things, it doesn't separate. So uh, this is a Spear Gold Dot uh, 64 grain um, 223. 
Yeah, it is a 223. Um, duty round works very, very well for penetrating barriers as well as stopping threats. Um, so those are the kind of the three big types of rounds on the market. There's a lot of different specialty rounds out there like taps and stuff like that. But that's kind of your three basic, your basic types of ammunition. So when people ask me, you know, um, I, I, you know, ask me what's the what's the best home defense gun? Well, it's all relative, um, but my favorite is is your your short barreled or pistol um, pistol size AR-15. Um, one, um, the the ammunition if you have good quality ammunition like the, like a Spear Gold Dot, it will go through less walls than a nine millimeter round as well as buckshot or or definitely a slug, twelve gauge slug. So it'll go through less round uh, less um, walls because of the lightness of the round yes it is high velocity but the lightness of the round when it starts hitting walls drywall studs it starts to tumble or what we call yaw and when the yaw when the yaw is imparted onto the round due to it hitting stuff the muzzle block the muzzle sorry the velocity of the round not the muzzle velocity but the velocity of the round degradates extremely at an extremely, extremely high rate exponentially and so what that does is it prevents um it prevents it going through multiple amounts of things um People go, I, I, I just don't believe that. Well, believe it, because that's why the mili that's why the military, as well as law enforcement, is getting away from MP5 sub guns, um, because they're starting to realize that these go through less walls, and the the length at which you can touch you can touch a bad guy or you know a target is a lot further than a nine millimeter round, and it's more effective at range. So. Um, with this rifle here, I can engage targets at what we call smelling distances all the way out to um, 600 yards very, very easily. Um, again, but you have to know your holdovers and your drops of your round. So uh, good quality ammunition is absolutely key. I can carry 30 rounds in my rifle um, for standard capacity. I can go to 20, I can go to 10, I can go up to a 60 round um, coffin mag or you know casket style mag or a, uh, or a drum mag. So I can carry a lot of ammunition. Um, and people go, well, do you really think you need that much ammunition to defend yourself? Well, you don't, you won't need it until you need it. And I'd rather have it and not need it than need it, not have it. Um, also shooting this rifle is extremely easy. Um, a lot of times when I take new people to the range and they're shooting pistols, um, there is quite a steep learning curve. Well, when the minute I get them behind one of these, one, they're in, very intimidated at first. Cause they're like, oh, it's one of those scary black rifles. That the minute they start shooting it, they're like, "There's no recoil whatsoever to this." Yes, there's a loud bang, and there's a there's there could be some flash, but you'd be surprised. They start shooting really, really tight groups very, very quickly um, with this with this uh, type of uh, gun, and it's simply because of the, the round as well as the, the the ballistic accuracy of the of the rifle. It just it just works, um, but it does not blow big holes in targets. It is a the best way of explaining it is this is a 22 long rifle on steroids. Nothing more, nothing less. You want to break it down to its very basic level. That's all it is, um, and it's been demonized all over the world. Um, and it's I'm sorry, it just it's it's just it's dangerous. Yes, everything we do do in life is dangerous. I have a pool, you know my if I have a pool in my backyard, my odds of drowning go exponentially up. It, it's just the way it is. Uh, so uh, types of ammunition work very well. So. Um, Let's move to magazines. There is there are so many different types of magazines, and I think I have almost damn near all of all of the types. Um, so your your kind of your more popular magazine is your is your Magpul. Um, your Magpul like a P Mag, uh, very popular, very durable, uh, reasonably priced. You know, 15 bucks. If you don't buy it on uh, cheaper than dirt, uh, you know you're going to be around 15 dollars. If you're buying it for cheaper than dirt, you're going to be like 50 bucks. Um, don't get me started about those those scumbags. But again, um, P Mag is a very popular mag. Uh, typically, 30 round magazines, and then I've had a I have a couple uh, 20 rounder straight mags. Uh, good for uh, more precision work, uh, prone work. Um, then moving on to like your USGI style mag or your aluminum style mags. Uh, very popular. Carried these in the military for a very long time, um, and they work. And they're reasonably priced, uh, cheap. Uh, they work. You know, it, it doesn't mean that it doesn't work just because the P Mag came along doesn't mean that this is not good enough it's really really good mag um, loaded the 30 rounds i always download one to two rounds just to be safe so i can insert it into my my gun but usgi mags they also make uh, hk makes steel mags but you're looking at like 80 to 90 dollars for a steel mag you know that's hk for you just charges more for the same thing um one that's uh one that's pretty interesting is your lancer style mags so they are they're clear or translucent uh, this one's a, uh, a uh, 
TAN or FDE, whatever you want to call it nowadays. Uh, so you can see the rounds that you have has uh, markers on the side. So it's a polymer, um, a polymer, uh, a polymer base, polymer mag, and then it has uh, aluminum, uh, sorry, steel, uh, solid uh, stamp steel um, feed lips here. Uh, very quality. Um, a little more expensive, but it does have the the, uh, the engineering behind it that, to make it very, very durable. Um, and then the last one, uh, your Daniel Defense Mag. This uh, was given to me at SHOT Show. I got about six of these for SHOT Show to uh, beat them up. They're a 32-round mag, unlike the other ones that are 30-round th uh, mags that you load to like 28 or, or 29. Um, so very quality mag. Um, yeah, they don't fit well in mags carriers. There's another thing that I dealt with, Dan, and I'm, I don't know if you've dealt with it, but you can see, um, or the Lancer mag, sorry. Yeah, sometimes the Lancer mags may, may or may not fit. It just depends on that, uh, depending on the type of mag carrier you run. Uh, this one's pretty slick, but um, you're going to see here, actually, this one is removed. You can see the hole here, the hole right here. Um, so uh, a problem I ran into with these when I started beating them up and I... I was running one time on, a, on some uh, some law enforcement training, and I dove the gun into the dirt accidentally, uh, tripped, and and my the magazine hit the dirt, and um, and this part this actually snapped that detent snapped off, and then what happened was this base plate can slide off, and I don't want it to go flying crazy, but I, what happens is all this stuff all the guts fall out of the bottom of it. So literally I had a yard sale of 30 rounds, 30 rounds fly out the bottom of it, mag, um, the uh, um, the uh, mag spring, follower, everything, just just fell right out, uh, speed reloaded it and went to town. But again, plastic detent, it took a nose dive and it slipped out and everything just fell out the bottom. Yeah, Dan, that's funny as hell, it is, it is funny. Um, I did a speed reload, My uh, one of my fellow instructors was quite impressed, he like, you looked at it for a quick second and then just, grabbed another mag and reloaded it. Um, so that's one, in my opinion, fatal flaw of the Daniel Defense mags. Uh, I talked to designers, I don't know where they're at with it. Um, but, you know, for the most part, go with quality mags. Uh, again, Lancer, I know Dan, you, you had an issue, you had an issue with the mag carriers, the Lancers, but they're quality mags. P mags are quality. Uh, you know, Daniels have some issues and then you can't go wrong with your ESGI 30 round magazines. They just have worked since Vietnam. They work every day. So that's magazines. We talked about ammunition, magazines, um, dispelled a couple myths. Um, let's talk about the rifles. So I talked about the difference between 5.56 five, and 223. Um, mine's kind of a, a Franken, uh, just S tax. Yeah, and aren't great. Okay, that's uh, the Kiwis. So, um, so with, with rifles, mine's kind of a Franken gun. Uh, it's just been built over the years. Uh, this is the same rifle I've carried, uh, let's see, going on almost 11 years of law enforcement and uh, then a couple years. Um, so yeah, it's it's just, but now it, it's been upgraded over the years. Um, started out as an M&P, Smith & Wesson M&P, um, and then kind of built through there. So I'll just take you from, from beginning to end. Uh, my muzzle device is just a standard A2 birdcage. Um, there is there are a lot of muzzle devices out there that are very fancy and do a lot of stuff. Um, in my opinion, the best kind of all around that does flash suppression as well as um, muzzle compensation is your A2 style birdcage. So you'll see at the bottom it's it is uh, blocked, and then at the top you're going to see uh, vents. So what this is designed to do is equal and opposite reaction. Gas goes up, pushes your muzzle down. It doesn't do it 100%, but it does a great job. And then it also dissipates the flash as it comes out. Um, my barrel, uh, let's talk about barrels here. So barrels, all barrels are not created equal. And there's only a couple of companies around the world that actually create barrels. Um, and then these companies actually put names on them. So uh, the companies that I trust the most are, are your cold hammer forged barrels. Um, that's FN. Uh, and and the, two, the two big ones are FN um, and Daniel Defense. Those are the two companies that make um, cold hammer forged barrels. And I'm not going to get into the nuances between button rifle barrels and cold hammer forged barrels. Um, so I have a Daniel Defense Mark 18 barrel in this. In this, um, the best way of explaining a barrel is it's truly the heart of your rifle, um, and that's it. It really just de determines whether your rifle is is good or bad. Um, because if your heart is bad, your everything else is going to go go the way. Um, so you you don't have to get the most expensive barrels in the world, but like a Daniel Defense barrel, FN barrels. Uh, Noveski made, made uh, they actually worked with barrels um, and they were actually FN uh, cold hammer forged barrels. 
Um, actually, they were 249 saw barrels. Uh, very heavy barrels, but they worked. Um, this is type of your, your, like your mid-grade style barrel uh, for weight. Um, so uh, like a Met Mark 18 barrel, any kind of Daniel Defense barrel, in my opinion, it's, it's the highest quality, in my opinion. Um, and they just work every day. Uh, so uh, with barrels, uh, again, not all barrels are created equal. So a lot of people... Um, a lot of people want, don't understand, um, a lot of people don't understand what barrels are. So, um, I'll just do a quick, a quick explanation behind it. So barrel length is a, is a, um, is a, is an absolute thing. So, you know, your standard like M4, you saw your, your standard, um, M16 was a 20 inch barrel. So it was 20 inches. It was a 20 inch barrel. Um, but the rifling, and so we'll explain the rifling real quick. Um, it's usually one in however many inches. So uh, the original, um, the original uh, M16 was a 20 inch was a 20 inch barrel with one in 11 inch rifling. So it's actually denoted by one over 11, or a one in 11 inches. So that means that for every so for every 11 inches of barrel the bullet would rotate, do one complete rotation. Um, Dan, you're asking 10.5 or 11 and a half. Um, both of those work just fine, just depending on both, depending on the, uh, the, the caliber and everything like that. Um, I do a 10.3. I like that 10.5. A lot of people are really liking that 11.5. If you could get something like 11.5 or even just a little bit longer in a mid length, uh, gas system, you're going to be on point. Um, I run a carbine gas system. I know I'm getting a little in the weeds on that, but, um, yeah, I hope that answered your question. Uh, yep, and uh, Catlin, you uh, just answered it. But back to this. So your your, your original M16 was a 20 inch barrel, um, 11 inches per and get one rotation. So do the math. You have almost two rotations before it exits the barrel. All right. So that's your M16. Your M uh, your M4. Or like the, let's just go to the common varieties right now that we're dealing with in AR-15s. You typically have a one in nine inches. You have a one in seven inches. So which one has a? So let's just go back. Which one has a faster pit twist rate? Yep, the one in seven has a faster twist rate. Um, Cade's asking about uh, any problems with the Ruger ARs. There has been some quality control issues with Ruger ARs. Um, it's no no disrespect to. To Bill Ruger and his company, uh, but there have been some quality control issues pertaining to uh, head spacing. Uh, I've had a couple guns that uh, that that head spaced. I know Catlin, uh, when you worked at a gun store one time, you had numerous amounts of Ruger ARs. Um, if, if you're if you're asking me my opinion, save your money and, and get a, a a little better quality product. Okay, so back to the twist rates. So one in seven is your right now is your one of your fastest twist rates on the market. One in nine is one of your slowest for a 16 inch barrel. Um, and then they created a one in eight, kind of a compromise. So how important is, is twist rates? Well, um, so the best way of explaining it from a layman's perspective, um, your heavier bullets, so I, sorry, your lighter bullets, like your 55 grain, the one right here, the M193, your 55 grain, typically likes slower uh, twist rates, your one in eight and one in nine. Um, while your 62 grain and upwards of, you know, 70, uh, 76, 72, I forget what it, what it is, 76 or 72, likes your one and seven. Um, the reason why is you're maximizing your accuracy with your spin rate. So there has, has been known, uh, so Catlin just updated uh, for Cade, Ruger has a few cracked bolts come through the shop, about five or six, so we've had cracked bolts problems. Thanks, Catlin. So, uh, so your, your, if you throw your lighter bullets into a one and seven, um, I have seen at range as the bullets continue to go down range, you'll see a puff of smoke and it's not really a cup puff of smoke. It's actually the bullet actually disintegrating in the air because it's spinning so fast and it tears itself apart. While if you try to put a heavier, a heavier bullet that is optimized in a one and seven into a one and nine, uh, what can happen is as your, as your bullet is flying through the air, it will actually start to yaw pitch and yaw and tumble and then as it hits your uh as it hits your target it'll look something like this it'll look like that and that like in the uh the uh the shape of the bullet going sideways so it's keyholing um and it be and the reason why is because it's it's not stabilized enough as it exits that barrel so 
to chop when you start chopping your barrels i've seen guys chop their barrels and they have a one and nine a one and nine twist and they chop it to like 10.3 um you're going to have a lot of problems um shooting accurately with that rifle because the stabilization isn't there you're you're barely getting one one rotation out of the barrel as it comes out um, while if you're running a one to seven you're getting about a one and a half uh, or so um, rotations before it exits the barrel so you're optimizing spin rate on that i know we're getting to the weeds about this but it's important for you to understand um, when you start shopping rifles these are things that you want to ask you know what's your twist rate is it one in a, you know your m16 is going to be 111 it's quite slow so it's good for lighter bullets we start shooting heavier bullets out of that it, you're going to be destabilized and but when we start looking at ar-15s like your your most of your sporting rifles you're going to be in that one and nine one eight and one and seven um in my opinion with the way that things are going nowadays I, I really like one and seven if you're if you're looking at possibly shooting a shorter barrel or chopping it you're you really want to be in that one and seven category um so again cold hammer forged i'm a huge fan of um yeah chrome line works great they do um but um you know check your twist rates on your barrels because that's that's vitally important that's the heart of your rifle your your barrel so um moving on to barrels um from barrels uh four ends um right now your kind of your your choices for your modern aspects are your m lock your key mod i'm not getting in it you know honestly the, the the fight arguments battles between the key mod people and the m lock uh, people in my opinion are completely elementary um, yes, there's been tests that M lock is far is superior to key mod. Uh, it, I really don't care. It it works. Um, now the Picatinny style rails um, in the the the, uh, the 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 just the slick four ends they work. Um, but for mounting accessories, I keep mine pretty simple. Um, working with Travis and, and Haley Strategic, yeah, you're gonna put lights, lasers, and crazy stuff on it. Um, but for a patrol rifle setting, I, I try to keep it simple. Um, so I'd run a key mod, uh, which keeps everything very, very thin. Um, so for me, grasping the rifle is, is very easy and indexing my hand to a hand stop is very, very easy. Um, so you can go with that. Uh, I choose a vertical foregrip like the stubby from BCM. Um, I used to run a full length vertical foregrip, um, just really wasn't necessary. I use the vertical foregrip more as a hand stop. So when I mount the rifle, um, I actually use it as a hand stop and not as a broom handle. Um, so I actually use it as a hand stop and it works great. And with the small key mod rail system here, um, it minimizes that, that girth on the, uh, on the grip. Um, the only fair warning is if you're pistoling your rifle, your, rifle, your, your AR-15, if you're going to put a pistol brace on it, and you're gonna classify as a pistol, do not, and I repeat, do not put a vertical foregrip on it. Um, that would classify that weapon as an AOW or an any other weapon, and you have to pay a $5 tax stamp for this. So this is a short barreled rifle. It's, it's classified as a short barreled rifle. I paid the $200 tax stamp, got it registered through the National Firearms Act. If you're going to, cir not circumvent, but if you're going to go at the pistol route and then apply for your Form 1, you're gonna apply for your Form 1, um, to get a short barreled rifle or any rifle that has a less than a 16 inch uh, barrel and then uh, 29 overall in, overall length um, you're going to have to um, if you're going to go pistol route do not put a vertical foregrip on it you're going to get in trouble um, i'm not saying people are going to look out for that just don't do it understand the laws if you're going to get into this game okay so uh, vertical foregrips they make afgs they make or you just go slick on the front that works as well too um if you're going to have a rifle, make sure you have some type of iron sights. Um, in my opinion, these are absolutely mandatory. Um, the optic is is optional, but iron sights as a professional rifle or a home defense rifle are absolutely necessary. Uh, make sure you have a good set of quality iron sights. Uh, I, I like the Troys. Uh, Troys are really, really well made in my opinion. They just get beat up and they work every time. Um, there's a lot of companies out there. Magpul, the, 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 uh, the Embus, in my opinion, um, do they work? Yes, um, but the polymer ones, I'm not a huge fan of. And the pros, I've seen a lot of people um, running the Magpul Pro uh, um, backup iron sights, and they're they're wonky at best, and they fail. Um, I like Troy; they work really good. Knights Armaments, another good company that makes them. Yes, they're expensive, but they're quality, and they survive. Okay, so now we've left uh, iron sights. Let's talk about um, let's talk about lights. So there's so many different types of lights that you can buy for carbines. Uh, it's 
again, like I tell people with, with these rifles, uh, there's only two limitations with an AR-15, your imagination and your bankroll. Um, and your imagination gets your bankroll um, in trouble really, really quick. These are the, uh, not to be misogynistic, it's just the fact these are the grown man's erector set. Uh, we trade our erector sets in to, to build these or the make grown man's Barbie doll. So the lights are a, a huge, um, are a huge thing. So um, I run just a simple um, Streamlight TLR1 HL on the top uh, to the dismay of a lot of guys at Haley Strategic. They're like, why the hell do you run that light? It just works. Um, it runs a switching system up here. So whatever hand I'm running, whatever hand I'm running, it's ambidextrous. That's important to me. Um, if you set up a light set that you can only run um, with your primary hand or your primary, you know, your support hand, um, you're kind of limiting yourself in my opinion. A lot of guys like real uh, tape switches. Tape switches are good. Um, they're getting, they've gotten a lot better um, than when I was in the military. They were they just garbage. They just broke all the time. Um, so, I, so a lot of people run a six o'clock tape switch and then run it, uh, you know, three or nine o'clock depending on where where you're at. Um, really well made. Uh, my two kind of top of the line ones are Surefire and Streamlight. They work really 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 good. Uh, you know, Streamlight and Surefire are awesome companies. Uh, Modlight as well as Owl, uh, the Owl, uh, Cloud, Cloud Defense. So Cloud Defense and um, and Modlight are another two companies that are really, really well made. Um, the uh, Cloud Defense, it, it's a bigger light, but it's tank tough. Uh, so those types of four lights, uh, I'm not a huge Enforce guy. Um, had some, have had issues with Enforces. They just, they break at times. Uh, so you stick to those four companies, Surefire, Streamlight, um, Modlight, and Cloud Defense, you're, you're not going to go wrong. Um, you don't have to spend a bucket load of money, but make sure you get a good quality light. Cry once, buy once, or buy once, cry once. Okay, so now moving from your light, let's talk about optics. Um, this is a huge polarizing thing with optics. Oh my gosh. Um, and, there, and, a, and a lot of it is just elementary arguments in my opinion. Um, people ask me, what, who, what company do you trust? Honestly, um, I've used Aimpoint when I was in the military. I used EOTech a little bit when I was in the military. I used Trigicon ACOGS when I was in the military. Um, and then when I got into civilian law enforcement, um, they only allow non-magnified optics, red dots. Um, and so it was an easy solution for me. The first optic that I got was the Aimpoint Pro. This was actually the optic that I had for a numerous amount of years. Um, and it is just, it's just a bomber optic. No matter how how bad I try to kill it, no matter no matter how bad I try to kill it, it just it just won't it just won't die. Uh, it just will not die. Um, needs a new battery, but um, but the battery. What I do is uh, this battery on most times will last typically over a uh, couple years. Um, never turn it on. Never you know never turn it off. Just leave it on. Um, but what I do with 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 your aim points. Um, your battery life on these can be anywhere from 50 to 90,000 hours, depending on the setting you're on. Um, but I replace the battery every year. So uh, on my birthday, I replace the battery. I've never had a dead battery. Uh, completely waterproof. Um, and then there's night vision settings. If, again, if you need night vision settings. But this was the first optic that I had in my law enforcement career, the Aimpoint Pro. Um, never had a problem with it. Ever had a problem with it. Um, they just work. Uh, they're really, really quality. Um, and then uh, a couple years ago, I saw, before they released it, I saw the Comp M5, the Aimpoint Comp M5. Uh, so you can see it's a lot smaller package on the rifle. It runs a AAA, uh, AAA on it. Uh, so it's very high quality. Um, and then the, the batteries are super easy to, to get. Um, you know, uh, AAAs are a lot easier to get than the proprietary style batteries. Um, Comp M1, oh my, Comp 1, or Comp M1, uh, Mike. So, um, so the, 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 this is kind of like the micro, um, to, uh, with, with a triple A battery storage. Um, in my opinion, this is one of the finest, uh, red dot sites on the market right now. Um, so I ran EOTEX for a couple years, uh, problems with EOTEX I ran into is they have a, typically have a short battery life. You're looking around 5,000 hours. It is a hollow, uh, a holographic site. I really like that 65 MOA, uh, circle with a, with a one MOA dot. Um, these are running uh, two MOA dots and just just the dot, um, but it has a, a little shorter lifespan on the battery. And then the um, and then the other aspect was um, 
they, they kind of broke because they had the plastic housings. They, they broke at times. Um, I just tell people, if you're going to look for an optic, look for a quality optic. Um, you know, can you get an L can? Yeah. The one, the four L cans, they're great, but you're going to drop $2,000 on a, on that. And a lot of guys are like, ah, I, I really want an L can. Well, why? Well, cause Navy SEALs carry them. Well, you're not Navy. You're not a Navy SEAL. You don't have to get an L can and spend and drop $2,000 on an L can. Um, ACOGs are great. Uh, I ran an ACOG for a year when I was in the military. Um, very quality, you know, typically four power or, or, you know, more, they do make like a two and a half, um, good quality, but you're stuck with what you have. Um, people really like the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the magnification, but sometimes you don't always need magnification. Um, a lot of people get the three power magnifiers or six power magnifiers that they run with a red dot, good quality. Um, my agency started allowing them just to enhance observation ability. It should not enhance your shooting ability. All it should do is enhance your observation ability. Um, the other thing um, that is popular right now is uh, ULPVOs or low power variable optics. So you're one to one to, uh, used to be one to four. Now it's like getting to one to six, then it went to one to eight, and now there's a, their vortex has a one to 10. Um, of course, the, the, the broader the span, uh, typically you're gonna spend more money. So your one to fours now are very reasonably priced. Um, your one to sixes are getting up there. Your one to eights are a lot more expensive than the one to tens. You're looking at well over $2,000 uh, for that. But again, that's the newest technology out right now. Now, does it take more training to train somebody on a low power variable optic? Yes, it does. There's parallax. There's so many different factors. Eye relief, um, and I could go on and on and on and on. Uh, whether it's a front focal plane or you know single focal plane, it, it, it's just it's just bewildering. But and I'm not going to get into it. We're already at 36 minutes on this video. But again, that's the the mindset behind it. Um, so again, you know, get your iron sights, get your light first, and then worry about your optic. But again, quality optics good. Um, I run a, a Timney trigger in mine. Um, it is a it is a duty rated trigger. Um, I went with a straight trigger because I really like the feel of straight triggers. You get that straight pullback. Um, it is a single stage trigger, um, but it's rated at five five pounds. Uh, so it's run, running a five pound trigger on it. Um, so it's a duty rated trigger, but it's a single stage and I don't like the creep. When I press the trigger, I want the gun to go off. I run a 49 degree safety on mine. Um, I just love the way the, the safety throws um, and I've never had any accidental deactivation with it. Um, it's good stuff. Uh, we're gonna put Mike in here. Let's see here, go live. Is Mike here, waiting for Mike. Mike, uh, so um, Mike from Tactical Considerations, former Army Ranger guy. Uh, you're, uh, not, you're not driving, are you? Oh, I'm driving. Oh, Jesus. Uh, so but the light uh, is terrible. So I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad Mike joined us. Uh, former Army Ranger likes to eat uh, crayons and stuff. I know you're not a Marine, but uh, you know, just resident badass, and he uh, owns Tactical Considerations. So, did you want to chime in on any of this? Oh man, did you ever get the chance to run a crew served ACOG on a 240? I did not. I ran a uh, M68 on on a 240. Okay, so we got to test them out when I was in. But yeah, dude, the uh, the aim point man, the first one I saw was the first. It was like the ML1 or something, man. You're aging yourself. Uh, oh, dude. Well, no, it was the thing was like a decade old by the time I had seen it. Oh, well done. A decade old. At least, at least, yeah. But they worked, right? They're still, they're still there. I guarantee <laughs> they still run. That's the army. We got rid of those quick in the air force. Um, oh man, the sun is murder, dude. I'm going to pick my dog up. Yeah. Well, you're on. Uh, you're on like three different platforms right now. Um, so awesome. Uh, so yeah. So um, you know, grips like your your rear grips. Um, I run a Magpul. I'm not a huge Magpul guy, uh, but Magpul, um, they do make like a K2 grip, more straight up and down than your standard like A2. Uh, ran into a lot of problems running like SBRs, um, where it really just really canted my wrist um, and started getting a lot of wrist pain, shooting more more rounds. Um, would you Do you run like a straight up and down mic, or do you run more A2 style? No, I, I like at least the least aggressive angle just because I've, banged up my wrist and fist so much yeah. that the least aggressive angle possible 
gives me the best result. Yeah. Plus, we don't shoot like Olympic style anymore, so I don't know why they even still sell A2 style grips, man. Yeah, I guess some guys just really like the feel of it. I think the professionals like you and me, I think we're getting away from it. We're really going to that straight up and down, reducing the uh, the angle there. Um, slings, uh, there are so many different slings out there. I just tell people, get, get a quality sling. Um, a sling to a rifle is like a holster to a handgun. Uh, and um, now I'm running uh, like super old school. This is the original Magpul Dynamics uh, sling that I bought. I got that one too. You do? <laughs> you Dude, this is... Yeah, I got a brown one. Dude, yeah. this, I have a brown one. I paid 70 bucks like a couple years ago because they don't make these anymore and you can't buy them. You, you can't find yeah, them. Yeah, the when the Ace Out first came out, you know, the, the sling loop for yeah, the rear. I the still rear. have it right here. Oh, dude, those were so hot until you realize how freaking noisy they are when you're entering a house. Yeah. Yeah. So you well, know. I got to roll, brother. All right, I'll catch I you later, Mike. I'll get, get catch you later. Thanks for joining. Later, man. All right. So, um, so slings, I always tell people, get a good sling. Um, I ran a Magpul, this Magpul one. Uh, this was actually designed by Travis Haley um, on a ship. I actually saw the uh, the prototype at Haley Strategic Headquarters. They actually had the prototype. Travis is like, here it is, and this is the original one. It was actually uh, original rubber, and it was sewn with... Uh, dental floss on a ship so this is one i run i've ran it for numerous amounts of years it is a multi-mission sling so that means that i can run it in a two-point configuration when i don it um say i'm trying to get it over duty gear and then i can clip it right here and go to a single point configuration it does have the asap original style um i've just never changed it so as i drop the gun if i if i switch shoulders um it's extremely fast and it keeps everything up on target. So when I switch, which switch hands, um, I'm here and it keeps everything on target. Uh, it just works really, really well. So uh, look at the slings that you're using. Look at the slings you're using. Um, I, the two point slings are great, um, but switching to shoulders or moving around, it can be cumbersome at times. Uh, just food for thought on that. Uh, so like your slings, like your uh, Haley Strategic, uh, D3 sling, one of the best on the market right now. It's also convertible like the Magpul sling. Um, your Blue Force and your um, your uh, Viking Tactics, so solid slings as well. Um, just food for thought on that. And then uh, moving back, uh, moving back to your buttstock. Um, again, buttstocks are really just kind of what you really, really want. It, it's 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 just user inter user preference. Um, I've ran this Viltor EMOD stock for, I don't know, um, <laughs> I want to be like you when I grow up. <laughs> Thanks, John, from Powder Keg. Uh, so uh, a Viltor EMOD, uh, they just work. It did have, you know, it has a storage compartment. Uh, I've never used this storage compartment ever, but it's supposed to hold a couple rounds or some, uh, some batteries, and then it does have storage compartments right here for batteries that you can shove down the tube. Uh, the reason I like it is it just the way it interfaces with my my uh, my cheek. Um, it really just interfaces with the cheek very very well. But again, it's it's so user preference. Uh, Jeff, thanks for joining me. I appreciate you joining me. We're kind of at the tail end of this. Um, I got 20% battery on that one. But um, uh, so yeah, uh, butt stocks. You know, I wouldn't say all are created equal. Um, it, some people like a little more, like me. I like the, the way this interfaces with my cheek. The more minimalist would be like a, like a B5 stock um, or just like an A2 style stock. It just really depends on what you want. Um, but with, with these rifles, I always tell people, make sure you buy quality. Um, again, you buy once and you cry once. Um, for example, like aim point, if there's anything that's wrong with my aim points, I just call aim point and they just replace it or they replace parts to it. Um, everything on my rifle for the most part, um, has worked ricky tick tick. A lot of people make fun of the fact that I have a, uh, kind of a hodgepodge gun put together. I don't know how many SWAT guys have looked at my gun. Um, going to, to Haley Strategic Trainings and getting razzed about this rifle. And I'm like, dude, it works. It just, it worked. Um, yes, I have a Daniel barrel. Yes, I have a BCM uh, grip. Yes, it started as in Smith and Wesson. Um, yes, it has a, a, uh, an MP3, um, bolt carrier group in it um yeah it has the original troy sights but guess what um some you know and i i run usgi usgi mags in it yeah guess what it all works it all works and it shoots accurately it does the job that i want um and it hasn't failed me um yeah 
I run the, the optic on this is just as much, if not more than the rifle itself. And that's kind of the way it's not why it should be, but that's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just the way it is. Uh, okay, Jim, that's cool. Josh, when I die, I'm coming back as you. Okay. Um, I didn't know you were, uh, what was it? Uh, Hindu or Buddhist or, you know, uh, coming back, but, uh, but again, just get good quality gear that just works. Um, you don't have to, you don't have to be a Knights Armament fanboy. You don't have to spend a buttload of money on it, but make sure you get a good quality gun and then to start it. And then if you want to build it from there, build it from there. But then also make sure when you're building it, make sure you, you, you do it right and be safe. Cause again, these things are, these things are pipe bombs. They can be pipe bombs. You know, you don't do it right. Um, thing blows up in your face. And with like a 5.56 five, round, you're looking at well over 60,000 pounds per square inch right here. So if something's going to blow up, it's going to blow up right there. And it's either going to go out your mag well, or it's going to go in your face. Um, so make sure you, you, you consult with people that, that know it and not in a garage and going, you know, Bubba's bag of bullets. Um, so I hope, you know, I explained a lot of, to a lot of people a lot of the myths behind the AR-15. Um, yeah, again, it is not an assault rifle. It's Armalite rifle. Um, it's not this evil, scary rifle that, that people try to pause it on, on the world. But if you have any more questions, comments, concerns, email us. Again, this is the Fireside Chat with Guardian. We do it every every uh, weekday at 5 o'clock. We have a new um, episode, talk about something new um, every weekday. Uh, so we wanted to talk about AR-15s and home defense and stuff like that. But then, um, again, questions, comments, concerns, uh, email me, message me on Instagram, message me on Facebook. Um, and that's what we're here for as, you know, as guardians, we're here to educate and we want to try to help as many people as possible to, to, to get into the gun game because more and more people now are getting into the gun game than ever. Um, and we want to help you, um, kind of take to that, that to the next level guys, be safe, uh, stay positive, uh, 5 PM bro. Some people still have to work. Well, uh, again, this is pretty much safe for work. If you want to take a break and uh, go that way. Um, but again, uh, that's the way it is. So uh, be safe, uh, stay positive. This is all I can say is uh, stay positive through this whole this whole debacle. Um, you can only control your reactions. And right now I'm more afraid of the people than the actual virus itself. So stay positive, be, be a positive light in some other, other people's eyes and uh, let's just keep it going. Have a great day, guys.